Rohit, thank you for that. Um, so we're going to move on now uh, to uh, how the paper deals with questions related to energy and finance. Um, so first, um, I'm going to introduce Elizabeth Chatterjee, uh, who's lecturer in regional and comparative politics at Queen Mary University of London uh, until September, after which uh, she will be at the Department of History at the University of Chicago. Uh, Elizabeth's primary research focus uh, spans political economy, energy history, and comparative environmental politics with a particular focus on India. Uh, she's currently completing a book manuscript on electricity and India's transforming political economy in the liberalization era, providing a new interpretation of the Indian development model and its limits. And, and I believe this book is called Electric Democracy, um, Elizabeth. So Elizabeth will speak more about the trade-offs between uh, energy, environment, and development in the Indian context. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting me, Kartik. I really enjoyed the paper, Rohit, so I'm thrilled to get the chance to discuss it now. Um, just one sort of observation at the outset, you have that lovely, very striking graph of just how much of an environmental outlier India is um, in terms of, at a pretty low level of GDP per capita, um, its particulate matter being very, very high. And I think one of the interesting things is if we actually looked at CO2 emissions, we'd see something quite different. India, you know, it does not look like China. It's, in fact, its per capita em emissions are still low. And it's, a, it's an amazing, striking divergence. It means that one and the same time, policymakers can say, we're comfortably going to meet our Paris commitments of reducing emissions intensity in CO2 terms by a third um, by 2013, that will be met years ahead while simultaneously having the worst air quality in the world. There's a sort of interesting divergence. And it goes, of course, to some of the interesting features you mentioned in terms of gender relations and so on, use of traditional fuels, um, as well as the um, kind of unusual characteristics of India stubble burning and all the the stuff that hits the news every single um, winter in North India. But anyway, I, if, if it's not too much of a liberty, I'd love to explore a little bit about the kind of Lamba Subramanian thesis in an un, unfashionable way looking at uh, a sector, because I actually think that your thesis works particularly well for the energy sector in explaining what is so unusual about India's energy trajectory. So um, this, the emphasis on de democratization before development, this um, striking sequencing, I think, um, you know, electricity is obviously the classic case that everybody cites on this. So universal suffrage arrives in 1950, and at that point, India's power sector is limited to about the capacity of a single medium-sized coal plant today. It's absolutely tiny. Quite quickly, India diverges from most of the world in that industrialists end up paying more for power than residential and especially agricultural consumers. Um, and this seems like a, such a good case for what you're talking about, how democratization then becomes self-reinforcing. Um, and Green Revolution input subsidies for cheap power um, prove very difficult to govern with really striking impacts, I think, possibly for manufacturing in India. So very, some of the world's most expensive electricity, highly unreliable. Is it then any wonder that you don't get manufacturing and instead you get very disaggregated production shifted into the informal economy and the risk therefore shifted on to small informal producers. Um, but I think there's something very interesting here. I, I glimpse that you have the, amongst your extra slides, um, I know that both Arvind and you have done lots of work on energy, thought about this a lot, and you've particularly worked on groundwater. I mean, it'd be quite interesting to show that off. Um, that this has had very perverse effects then, that subsidizing electricity has 
um, alongside, as you've shown, um, encouraging the production through minimum support prices of very water intensive cro crops like wheat and paddy in ecological zones that really can't support them has created a ground water crisis in North India. So I think the question that this interestingly raises for me is, are there hard ecological limits on the Indian growth model? I mean, the so-called agrarian crisis in some ways looks like um, the limits of the green revolution model. High fertilizer, high water intensity, high electricity usage models in areas like Punjab to grow paddy, a crop that cannot ecologically be sustained there, then is this implicated in the collapse of agrarian productivity? So I think this sense of ecological limits to the development model is, is quite um, alarming. Um, but I would also push you to, I would love to hear you explain a little bit more the second part of what I understand your thesis to be, which is that social cleavages actually explain this proliferation of subsidies um, for goods such as power and so on. Um, I'm agnostic on this. There's obviously been a huge amount of work on all sorts of other mediated factors like the availability of resources, the number of political parties and, some, and so on. Um, so I would love to hear you unpack this a little bit more, the relationship between cleavages and the extension of subsidies for these um, club, club goods rather than long-term investments in public goods. So turning to then think about the, uh, the, er the time period you're particularly focusing on from post-91, again, I think the energy story is hugely interesting. And it really, to echo Millen, um, I think it's really interesting. We don't see a linear process of liberalization. And this pushes me to ask, is it useful to think of this acceleration in growth just as one solid block? as the paper does, as a, a really sustained um, single episode. I mean, obviously you break this down in the paper a little bit into phases, but I'm particularly interested in that very high growth period from 2003 and whether we actually see true dynamism or something much more unsustainable. It's clearly bankrolled by the state through the public sector banks, um, Companies then get horribly over leveraged and this is what explains the twin balance sheet problem. I would almost say it was a triple balance sheet problem. It's hit the public sector banks, it's hit private corporations and the state governments too are horribly exposed because they are still paying for all these energy subsidies, especially electricity subsidies, which are the biggest burden on a lot of state budgets. I mean, this looks then much more status than our typical understandings of the liberalization era. So um, I would, again, you know, what does this actually look like in terms of the state business relations that undergird it? It's not liberalization. It's maybe something more like this kind of closed deal phase um, that that's particular people have kind of um, have observed. So overall, I'm, I'm really interested to hear you talk a little bit more about this idea of stigmatized capitalism that you note and how that might kind of upset some of our conventional understandings of the untrammeled power of big business and where this is actually going now in the present moment where we have much slower economic growth. We actually do have some exit, some, some big firms are bankrupt, Lanco, SR, Anil Ambani's reliance power or in the toilet and so on. I'd love to hear you um, talk a little bit about, about that. But overall, I, I'm very taken by your paper and I would, I'm very persuaded, unfortunately, by your pessimistic analysis of this. But my, my biggest question is, is this true dynamism or was this always fueled by very short-term state spending rather than marking any qualitative shift. Great, thank you, uh, Liz, uh, some thought-provoking comments. 
uh, there on both the um, ecological limits to India's uh, development model and whether what we were seeing, what we have seen is growth itself. So now we're going to move to um, uh, Sohani Kar, uh, who's assistant professor in the Department of International Development uh, at the London School of Economics. Uh, she's an economic anthropologist who looks at uh, the impact of financialization on poverty and development programs uh, and is currently working on financial activism and their impact on development goals. Uh, her book, Financializing Poverty, uh, Stanford University Press 2019, won the Bernard S. Cohn Prize for first book on South Asia uh, by the Association of um, Asian Studies. Uh, Sony will speak um, about the financing of development and its impact on uh, socioeconomic outcomes. Uh, thank you, Sohini, for being here, and over to you. Great. Um, thanks so much for inviting me to, to be part of this, and um, Rohit, for, for the article. Um, I teach, I've been teaching a core class in development, and we always end with India as a case study, and my question in that class is, why does India have this sort of paradoxical kind of outcome? So I wish I had this paper earlier for, for my class, um, but certainly for the future. Um, but I think one of the things that I'll come into talking a little bit more about the sort of finance aspect, but one thing I wanted to raise was we often talk about sort of the Indian case as the exception, looking at sort of earlier models of development, um, the China model, but also sort of the other modernization um, paths that you talked about in the paper. But what if the Indian case is actually exemplary of an emerging kind of development pattern that we see in, in other developing contexts? which is about sort of jobless growth, which growth isn't mapping onto the forms of structural change that we saw in earlier eras. Um, so in some ways, I think the India case is not only sort of this paradox that we're trying to understand in the India case alone, um, but perhaps something important to consider as we think of sort of development trajectories for um, you know, developing countries in, in different contexts. South Africa has similar kinds of patterns. Um, and so I think there's sort of reasons to sort of think about the larger global economy in which this is happening. Um, and to that extent, um, I think the what I look at in my own work, sort of the question of financialization and the sort of growing role of finance in the global economy. So on the one hand, we've been sort of looking at the service sector, um, broadly writ, um, and sort of manufacturing, but also, you know, thinking a little bit more about the sort of fire sector, sort of finance, insurance, real estate, um, and these other parts of the economy in which, um, which is shaping the sort of structures um, across you know, the world, but also within India, um, and what that does for the kind of development that is going on. Um, and so on the one hand, as a number of uh, people have already pointed out, the sort of question of what liberalization in India is, um, you know, looks very different from other contexts, even the banking sector of finance insurance in India post-liberalization has not been sort of this free for all in, in, in many ways. It's still heavily regulated. The state is involved in, in banking in many ways that are, are surprising from sort of priority sector lending. Um, so the state is still very much involved in shaping the way in which finance works in India, but that's not to say that finance hasn't expanded um, and taken up a larger role in the way in which capital is allocated. So when we look at sort of why certain regions get more capital than others, um, you know, what are the decisions that are going into sort of these investment strategies? So I think it's, um, you know, worth thinking a little bit more, or I'd like to hear a little bit more about what you um, think about in, in terms of the role of sort of finance itself as sort of shaping the way in which particular sectors are, are invested in. Um, and why, you know, that might have impact on the kinds of industries that get um, invested versus ones that don't. Um, and why that might mean that, you know, the areas that might have higher employment aren't necessarily the ones that are um, getting funding. So again, you know, things like real estate, for example, um, Raina Searle, an anthropologist, has looked at sort of real estate uh, speculation in, in Delhi. And again, here we see the ways in which money is coming into the sector, but it doesn't do a whole lot for the poor. So again, if we're looking at the disjuncture of growth, um, we have massive growth in, in real estate speculation, 
Um, but that, you know, obviously there are some construction workers, there are people working in that sector, but the sort of inequality of who benefits from, from those kinds of investments is, is massive. So again, what does the role of the, you know, fire sector versus labor um, mean? So again, trying to understand what the relationship in terms of growth is versus, you know, who's actually benefiting from, from those sectors. Um, and I think, again, um, in terms of my own work, we also look at the way in which financialization is increasingly drawing in sort of the poor. So on the one hand, there's a tendency to sort of look at finance as something that just happens in sort of high finance that, you know, what happens in the Bombay Stock Exchange doesn't really matter for, say, an urban poor person. Um, and in many ways, things like financial inclusion are actually changing that sort of pattern of inclusion. Um, so the fact that the poor are relying on things like microfinance now means that there is a kind of interest in what happens in terms of global financial crisis. So again, while previous financial crises, India has been somewhat limited in terms of the exposure to sort of the financial sector itself. Um, what happens as the poor are more and more integrated into it and what a crisis might look like when, you know, their own sort of interests are, are limited by that is something to consider. So on the one hand, we tend to look at financial inclusion as always having sort of positive impact on the poor, um, but we need to think more carefully about what that kind of inclusion actually means when people's assets are going into those areas. Um, so are they protected enough from vagaries of, you know, crises? Um, and what can the state do to ensure that the, the poor are protected when, uh, if and when the, the Indian markets are more exposed as liberalization um, continues. Um, and again, we see this in things like insurance as a form of welfare provision for the poor um, in the ways of you know, microfinance being used. So again, these things are tethering the poor in new ways that they weren't before. Um, so I think it's important to, to sort of rethink those connections. Um, and finally, I think in, in many ways, there is this sort of two paths to take. Um, there's a big push towards sort of, you know, the World Bank has its maximizing finance for development program. There's a big push to rethink what finance can do in terms of development. Can it, you know, go into sectors? Can there, is there social investment in underfunded areas? Um, and so there's one way to think that, you know, maybe finance can fix the gaps uh, that exist in, in development today, uh, which I think is the sort of more optimistic sort of idea around what finance can do for development. Um, but on the other hand, you know, there is this increasing disjuncture between the real economy and what is happening in, in sort of financialized realms. Um, and, you know, is there a danger where that becomes too um, untethered to the point that, you know, the, the sort of investment goes too high into this financialized realm with limited benefits for those who in India are really sort of at the margins of, of society. Um, so those are my comments. Uh, great, thank you, Sony. Um, so we were supposed to have Diego speak next, but I don't see him there right now, and I'm not sure where he is. So maybe we'll just let Rohit respond to you know the comments raised by um, Liz and Sony uh, again. You know, if, on the you know, so, so Liz talked about three issues: the the you know the ecological limits to India's growth model. Um, second, the social cleavages, do they explain subsidies, you know, towards power? Uh, and something that, you know, both Liz and Sony raised is, are we, what, what is what we've seen over the last 30 years, uh, dynamism, or is it something, you know, driven by, uh, you know, state, state spending, speculation, you know, different aspects of financialization? Uh, you know, how would you um, explain that? And also the point that, you know, so many raised is how finance, you know, shapes uh, different sectors, you know, uh, in terms of development. So I'll let Rose respond to that, and we'll hopefully get Diego back when you're done. So thanks a lot for those comments. I mean, this is, um, and I'll try my best to respond to uh, to them. So this is the graph that, that the Liz was talking about. It's just, uh, I, I'm not a groundwater expert, but I saw this graph a few years ago and I was just so shocked that I wanted to work on groundwater. 
Um, so this is not even a recent graph. This is 2012 in the, in the journal Nature, I th uh, Science or Nature. I think it was in Nature, yeah. Um, this is groundwater depletion across the world, as I think as measured by 2012. And it was just, I mean, if you look at this, so the scale is relative. So the absolute number actually doesn't matter. I mean, it matters, but you won't be able to see this graph, but just the relative scale is staggering, uh, right? So like, I mean, South Asia in general, but India in particular, uh, there's a huge problem of, 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 of groundwater depletion. And, and there, there are obviously various reasons for this. And, uh, and this in some ways, I think it really is, um, uh, it really captures what Liz was talking about is the limits of sort of ecological, the ecological limits of development. And, 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 and she rightly is pointing out that this is not devoid of political economy. And so a large part of groundwater depletion in India is, is unplanned urbanization and, 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 um, and bad agricultural practices. So, you know, Punjab has no business growing rice in some sense from the natural order of things. Sundarbans in Bengal does. But you know, you know, we grow wheat and uh, wheat and rice uh, in in the in sort of the interior parts of India, and and and, and th th this is ensured through a very wide and detailed web of input and output subsidies. So by input subsidies, you know, we mean things that that Liz talked about was, for example, free power. So you know, try taking free power away from the large farmer in Punjab, right? It's it's for some reason it's stuck to be a political entitlement. Uh, which is not, you know, I, I mean, you know, people have worked on this. Um, you know, it's not clear if it's actually going uh, to the small farmer at all. And so, a large part of the subsidy goes to very large farmers. Uh, on top of that, as an input subsidy, you're given free tube wells that work on electricity. And so, these tube wells run overnight, and actually, they extract groundwater uh, and that is then sprayed onto the field. So, there is huge utilization of groundwater to, you know, grow things. Uh, like wheat and paddy in, in the interiors of the country, then there are output subsidies like the minimum support price. So you're directly incentivizing. Uh, and, and remember, minimum support price doesn't have a bite, actually. It doesn't work very well in the Hindi heartland like Bihar, um, but it works pretty well in Haryana and Punjab, where people, again, because of the fact that they're directly incentivized to grow these crops, uh, grow these crops, and again, this is like a huge groundwater problem. So all of, all across the country, there are various reasons for why. You know, if you go to Bangalore, there's a separate reason for why there's a groundwater problem. In Delhi, there's a separate reason, but it is a huge problem, I think, that India has to face up to, in which uh, we don't have very good plans for. Um, um, you know, the, the point about PMI CO2 is is, is, is you know we, we did actually uh, make that graph as well, and we were kind of surprised. Uh, as, as, as Liz is, is pointing out about the difference in, in PMI and CO2, and that sort of led us to understand what actually causes PMI. And, 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 and she's right, you know, it, it's just, it's kind of staggering actually how much of an outlier India is. And this is driven by, again, a, a large variety of factors. Uh, urbanization, real estate is actually one of them. So uh, construction and stuff in, in urban India is, is a lot, and it's not done in a very planned way. And that leads to huge uh, sort of part particle suspension uh, in the air. Um, um, you know, great point about who started investing in the in the power sector in India. I did not know that, so that's a that's a very cool point about uh, the industries actually driving the, the 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 power sector initially in India, and of course, then followed by the Green Revolution and um, um, social cleavages and subsidies. Um, so, you know, this is a this is a you know again, this is a deep sort of question about. You know, it's a deep question about what kind of subsidies are first meted out and then stay, right? So in India, for example, it's very difficult to reverse subsidies. So, so you know, there's a, you know, you can take a social cleavage across the, you know, for example, across uh, you know rural versus urban India. You know, you have, you have you have subsidies such as fertilizer subsidies in India, which are actually harming the environment and the economy. They have almost no business in their current form of being there. You have because subsidies sometimes lead to some other subsidies. So you give subsidies to the farmers, and you give subsidy to the uh, to the manufacturer of, of fertilizers. Then you put an import restriction so that other uh, fertilizers cannot be imported in India, and so on. So so you know you're trying in, in this sense to cater to various sort of uh, people with either you know vested political interests or genuine social needs. Uh, and you end up creating this very wide web in 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 the context at least of of um, of, of fertilizers, uh, 
it, it, it's not clear actually um, uh, whether it helps you know people who are, who the subsidy is intended to in the first place. Um, you know, we, we mentioned this in the paper. You know, club goods versus you know a sort of a traditional investment in in in, in public goods such as you know goods such as health and education, um, and you know this is again uh, you know it, there is a there is a there is an interesting uh, documentary if you guys haven't seen by one of, if you two of my classmates from college called Katia Baz. You know, this Katia Baz is a guy in UP who goes and 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 you know. Uh, sort of, you know, you, you pay him to say, can you attach my wire to the local, uh, you know, to the local uh, sort of uh, uh, wire coming from the grid so that I can get electricity and I don't pay for it, right? So, so it's not as if, it's not as if, you know, the local politician doesn't know this. It is just understood in some, in some sort of political economy and almost sociological sense that it is their right. So, you know, uh, a, a, a slum in Delhi or Bombay doesn't pay electricity. There's a local slum lord that comes and collects rents from people for allowing them the protection to 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 put their wire to the wire coming from the from the from the local grid. So this also is a form of subsidy. Whether this is a good subsidy or a bad subsidy, you know, it's not clear to me. But but um, but in the absence almost of of uh, of formal mechanisms, we are resorting to these very informal channels, uh, you know, to provide things like basic electricity to people, which eventually is then because nobody is paying for this, it is putting huge sort of burden on the state that is continuously at the aggregate level. I mean, this, the numbers have to add up somewhere. And as Liz was pointing out, this has led to actually, you know, the state government debts of the discounts, which is popularly called uh, of, of, of of electricity boards in India are orders of magnitude of state GDPs. And so, you know, this money is going to come from somewhere and it's probably going to come. And in the absence, as, as Pooja was pointing out, of, of, of increasing tax revenue, this is going to be a huge burden on state government. So they're going to probably uh, borrow more and more and keep pushing this debt into the future. Uh, and it's not clear if this is how, how long this is sustainable. Um, um, true dynamism. So this is a point that both Sohini and and and, uh, and Liz raised. Um, so I, you know, beyond the lexicon and terminology, you know, I, you know, I would measure it through outcomes. You know, do we believe that that the growth in India, let's say from ninety five to two thousand ten, and this is what we try to argue a little bit in the paper. You know, did it sort of pull out hundreds and millions of people out of poverty? And the answer to that is broadly yes. And so. So whether that whether that growth should be called dynamism, whether it should be called state-directed capitalism, um, is you know is worth debating. Um, you know we have this graph in the economic survey in the I think in 2015-16 where we should make a global comparison of credit booms across developing countries in Latin America, in East Asia, and India. And India is not an outlier. Uh, you know so, so so the fact that some sort of state-driven capitalism drives booms in emerging economies in the late 90s and, and 2000s is actually not, uh, India is not at all an outlier in, in, in that sense. What India is an outlier in some sense, uh, it, especially in comparison to China, is how it manages the eventual bust that follows the boom. It's almost inevitable. Uh, was there too much irrational exuberance in India? Probably yes. So as, as this pointed out, you know, with you know, state governments, the state banks were overly leveraged, giving out loans because India doesn't have very deep capital markets. So almost all of the financing was hap as the growth was booming was happening through the state. Uh, but perhaps you know, and this is the point I mentioned to to in response to Milan's questions was, you know, the state's ability to then respond to the stress of the boom that creates the bust. You know, and this Pooja captures very well in her book. Was almost non-existent. So the regulatory role of the state, you know, for the how long does it take for the ARC, the asset restructuring, to step in? How long does it take uh, for you to clean up the books of banks and try to sort of you know restart and restart the the investment machinery? India kind of did very very badly in the bust after the boom. Whether India is an outlier in that or not, and whether therefore should we should judge this this uh, you know this period as dynamism is a, is a very good question, and I think. Um, I'm just saying in terms of the outcomes, you know, we, we were sort of more outcome driven. We do think it's dynamism, whether it was unusual, whether it was sustainable. I think it's, it's, it's a good question. It's sort of kind of playing out as we, as we speak. Um, 
um, uh, stigmatized capitalism, you know, this is kind of again to the point of, you know, I guess the, the fourth point that Milan raised, you know, is still an intellectual buy-in in the society, you know, whether you are, whether you are, you have the view, of, you know, whether you kind of the Larry Summers view of capitalism or you have the Thomas Piketty view of capitalism, but do you have a view that the private sector has a role to play in nation building, that the private sector has a role to play in, 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 in raising the standards of living, um, in India, and it's not clear to us that that, that intellectual buy-in has happened. We're not debating about the intensive margins of what market economy does for us. We're actually still debating about the extensive margin of, you know, whether private sector is good or not. And so um, I, 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 I think that's still up for up for debate. And that's you know kind of what Arvind sort of evocatively termed as stigmatized capitalism. Um, and in the absence of, of, of strong state capacity, it's sort of a, of a self-enforcing equilibrium. So because Vijay Malia exists, because Anil Ambani exists, capitalism is bad, right? So this idea that there is a, there is a legitimate form of uh, uh, you know uh, bankruptcy versus an illegitimate form of bankruptcy is still to be the intellectual buy-in still has to happen. Um, you know, so any great Good. points, you know? Yeah. So I'm going to just stop you there. Okay. Uh, and then move to Diego, who is back after okay. dealing with a fire situation that I hope is resolved. Um, so Diego is my colleague um, at the Institute of South Asian Studies. Um, his research focuses on India's politics and political economy, um, with special reference to themes of poverty and inequality. Uh, Diego is the author of The Autumn of the Matriarch, Indira Gandhi's Final Term in Office, uh, published by Hearst and Oxford University Press, and most recently uh, of um, the politics of poverty reduction in India, a UPA government 2004 to 2014, uh, published by Orion Black Swan. So Diego will unpack how the paper covers the question of inequality uh, in the Indian context. Hi, thanks, Kartik, and thanks everyone. Sorry, I missed the most of this, but no one got injured. The fire is extinguished um, and the firemen left, so we're good. Uh, I hope I will not uh, repeat um, things that you have already said, uh, although I think uh, I am sure that some other of you um, said that uh, the paper is great and uh, that uh, it's, um, well, I, I, I appreciate it a lot, two things. First, that uh, for once economists managed to write a paper that is readable by non-economists, uh, which I found it very refreshing. Um, and second, uh, um, that you really did a very good job of um, synthesizing a great deal of material uh, in a kind of coherent framework, well, in a coherent framework. Uh, so yeah, that was really, really good. Um, my comments and questions will focus mainly on three things. Uh, first, uh, your research question itself. Um, second, uh, the issue of taxation. And third, uh, inequality. The three of all these three things are uh, connected, I think. But let me start with um, your research question. So, of course, your paper documents that India's growth has been um, translated into is has not been translated into broader developmental outcomes at least uh, uh, as much as we would have expected um, but and you call this a puzzle uh, which i don't find it um, particularly puzzling uh, uh, at all um, and in a way um, it is sorry uh, in a way um, it is puzzling only if you expect that uh, the economic growth will kind of automatically translate into broader developmental outcomes, which basically never happens. And uh, like the theory works only mediated by institutions. And, uh, and one of the institution that you bring in is democracy, uh, of course, but um, I am always uh, kind of disappointed by this level of abstraction that it's very rarely uh, meaningful. If you, I, ha I, I teach a course on democracy uh, here at Yale in US and uh, 
we, I reviewed, I don't know how many papers uh, trying to connect democracy with the inequality, with economic growth, uh, with the gender equality, with this, with that. And the answer is always confusing, ambiguous, uh, with caveats. Uh, we don't really know because democracy is probably uh, too high a level of um, abstraction um, to be really meaningful. And so I think the kind of democracy that India is, is central to the answer um, to the puzzle. Um, and I think for what I heard, the bits and pieces that I heard today, some of you, I think already mentioned this, um, but you know, the kind of the India democracy is, is a democracy that has been able to tolerate high levels of inequality uh, by the state and by society that uh, few other democracies have and uh, few others highly successful developmental states, uh, if you like, have managed to tolerate. Um, and, um, and so if you, are, if you actually are willing to tolerate such levels of inequality, then it's not very puzzling uh, if uh, the resources that you use, that you have are not do not translate into uh, better developmental outcomes especially public uh, education or public health as we can see um, now um, so yeah in a way it's not very puzzling for knowing what i know about india is not very puzzling um, and especially if we think of what the others very successful economies in, in the list that is in the paper did, uh, which is, for example, investing uh, a lot in public health and education, which India has, has failed to do. Um, what I find more puzzling actually is the opposite question. Why has India managed to grow so much despite the fact that its developmental indicators are so bad? Uh, in many ways, or in a, in a comparative perspective, at least. So how come that India, despite the fact that it has a very poorly skilled workforce and a very unhealthy workforce, um, has managed to grow this much? I think that, to me, is um, a very puzzling question that I... Um, I continuously ask myself, and if you think of China's uh, literacy rates, for example, in 1982 were higher than what are uh, were India's in um, 2011. Um, so the, the, the gap is massive uh, in terms of the kind of human capital uh, that um, underpins uh, the process of growth uh, in India. Um, to me, this is uh, a, a big puzzle. Um, so yeah, so my question, I guess, is this. Um, have you thought about these opposite questions or if you like in the, the other direction of causality that it's from a development that you get growth uh, rather than expecting growth to be translated uh, into um, development? Um, the second question that I have is uh, why you never mentioned taxes? Uh, in the paper. To me, again, are a central element of the puzzle. Um, if you think that it's through taxes that you might expect to fund uh, public health and education, which again are the engines of uh, um, human development um, in many ways. Um, so you, um, in, in the, Devish Kapoor has uh, published a paper in the same issue of uh, uh, GP and uh, he shows that, well, the tax to GDP ratio is not particularly high, it's 18%. Um, and the proportion of direct taxes to total taxes is lower today than at independence. Uh, when, you know, it's, I guess, worth remembering that India inherited a taxation system uh, which underpinned the British Raj, which was basically an alliance with the elite groups. So um, the fact that, and, and of course, direct taxation is much more. Uh, regressive uh, than uh, indirect taxation. Um, sorry, direct taxation is much more progressive than uh, indirect taxation. Um, so, and so this again points to me to the fact that the India's democracy is a very highly unequal democracy that has a very high um, tolerance uh, for inequality. And this is reflected also um, in the way in which people are taxed. Um, so 
Um, again, and, and, and also in the way in which uh, money is spent. If you remember the uproar that uh, accompanied the uh, debate on the NREGA or the Food Security Act, we were talking about, you know, the state is going to go bankrupt, uh, the NREGA is going to, um, you know, uh, crowd out resources for anything else and etc. And we were talking about 0.3, 0.4% of the GDP, uh, which um, it's a kind of cheap policy, the NREGA, if you compare it with similar policies uh, in the developing world. And yet there was such a big debate and there was cuts here and there. And then the, uh, the program was underfunded um, after, just after a few years. Um, so, you know, the, the, even when very limited resources, one could say, uh, are actually spent for trying to um, improve the welfare of, of the bottom say 20% of the population, uh, there is a reaction uh, by, um, by, by the top of the system, so to speak. And, um, and, and for my third point is again, you, you basically never mention inequalities again in the paper, uh, except in terms of um, geographical inequalities uh, between states and the failed convergence. Um, and I, and I, would ask, I would like to ask you why so. Um, I, again, I'm not an economist, but I think there is uh, some evidence now, at least, that high levels of inequality are detrimental for economic growth, um, but also that uh, high levels of inequality might explain a great deal of the puzzle. How come that um, India doesn't, India's growth doesn't translate much into broader developmental outcomes? And uh, if I can um, share uh, my screen for just uh, one second, um, I hadn't seen, can you see the screen? Um, I hadn't seen this, this is taken from Piketty last book and uh, it shows the share of the top um, decile in total income and India is the purple line. Uh, and I, had, I hadn't realized that um, India has become from, you know, with this measure at least, uh, more unequal than, well, of course, Europe, China, Russia, and the United States. Um, and um, and you know this again. Um, it's um, it, it, it's to me a, 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 a big piece of the puzzle, and I, and I was wondering why you didn't um, you didn't think it was important to include it in uh, in your paper. Um, yeah. So. Um, the, uh, uh, my final point is again to go back to the issue of public um, expenditure on health and education, um, which um, uh, which again um, points to the fact that India is a state and a society that tolerates high level of inequalities also because um, the so-called middle classes and the upper classes just don't need these services. And uh, I know uh, as a fact that in South Africa, for example, uh, policymaker fought very hard to keep the middle classes and the upper classes in the public education and health system because they knew that if they left, um, policymakers would leave would would uh, lose an incentive uh, to keep them running and keep them funded at um, what they consider to be the optimal level uh, in india this never happened uh, or, or stop happening at least so we'll stop here and thank you again for a great paper that stimulated a lot of thinking great uh diego thank you uh Rohit, do you have, do you want to just respond very quickly to what Diego mentioned on the on one inequality and why you didn't um, uh, you didn't cover it robustly in the paper? Two um, taxes um, and three uh, the question of whether I mean, are you surprised that India did grow as much as it did given the the levels of uh, the levels of underdevelopment that you indicate in the paper. So the causation, the reverse causation is what um, what, did, what Diego tried to highlight there. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah very quickly, uh, uh, just so many sorry, I wasn't able to get in the last discussion to the finance question, but happy to talk about it offline. Um, 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 uh, Diego, uh, you know, excellent questions. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I'll, uh, I'll disagree slightly on the puzzle question in the sense that um, 
you know that, that you know is um, you, you know with with growth um, um, you know there is a, there is a kind of you you're right that democracy is a very high level of abstraction but but you would but it is kind of surprising that with high levels of inequality with the kind of health and education system india has even you know milan was mentioning this before you came so you know this difference between liberal and electoral democracy that india has still managed to maintain uh, some kind of electoral democracy and some and some semblance of of liberal democracy despite having uh, you know, an innumerable number of innumerable uh, cleavages in society, whether it's social or, or economic and so on. Um, you know, the opposite question is super important, right? You know, I, 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 it's, it's a super important way of framing the puzzle. I think it's, a, you know, worthy of a, of, a, of a paper, if not a book. You know, is, is the reverse causality actually an interesting or more interesting question that why has India grown? And I think there are various reasons for this. And I think there are various reasons for why India grew at the time that it grew, you know, including, you know, a very sort of sophisticated, uh, you know, sort of, uh, high, you know, skilled labor force and not a very sophisticated uh, unskilled labor force, uh, you know, services driven exports, uh, domestic consumption in India, uh, uh, the, the demography in India, so what point in time India gets young, what point in time its consumption goes up, savings rates in India, so why India was saving a lot it, traditionally, and that had, that, that made sure that the, uh, you know, state governments had enough, uh, state-driven uh, banks had enough money to direct investment. Uh, Liz's point of, you know, at that, at a certain point in time, you know, uh, investments were made in the right sectors, which grew at the time. So, um, I, I think super important question that why has this, I, I think I would frame it as that it's not perhaps that surprising that given those initial conditions, India was able to grow, but actually to your point that it was not able to grow further it is not it is facing these hurdles precisely because after a point these initial low hanging fruits have been taken we are converging to you know more and more to our production possibility frontier and now you're really sort of up against the constraint of health and education and without making these fundamental reforms or fundamental investments it's very hard to grow further uh, tax super good question um, we thought about it uh, I, I showed a graph actually earlier in my presentation uh, on tax uh, it just, you know, we just did have, at some point, both actually on tax and the other point you raised about um, high levels of inequality, we had stuff in the paper, it actually just got cut at the editing. I mean, we had to choose, uh, the editor said, you, you know, you're allowed X number of tables and graphs and we kind of wanted every story. So you see, actually, we do cite the Piketty report that you just mentioned in the paper, but we don't have that graph because it was, uh, so it's not kind of, you know, at some point we chose spatial over income equality, inequality, but you're, you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a, it's a hugely important point um, that, you know, but, 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 I, but, 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 but once it has to frame that question in how much of an outlier India is in the growth trajectory of other countries, and that's still not clear. So this is a, what you showed was a static graph, right? In, at this point in time, this is in calendar time, not in development time. So at this point in time, India is this unequal. It would be interesting to see in development time, you know, how unequal India is vis-a-vis -vis other countries. You know, I'm reminded again of, I've already cited Hirschman. Hirschman has this famous sort of thing about the tunnel effect, right? Like all, you know, you're standing at the start of a tunnel and one lane starts moving and you become happy because the same lane is moving. But after a while, if only your lane is moving and not my lane, then I'm going to get very, very frustrated. And then I'm going to do things that are going to lead to sort of other problems in society. So, you know, the fact that one lane is moving is that much, not much, that much of an aberration in India. What is to be seen in the future is, in, is in India able to move all the lanes now from this point onwards? And that I think is, is, is a very good question that you raise. And I, you know, I don't have good answers to that. And so uh, in terms of finally, the, the point about uh, tax to GDP ratio, um, direct versus indirect taxes and, um, you know, it's not true actually, and and, and so so in, in in the economic survey, one of the in one of the surveys we showed actually that the amount of money India spends as a fraction of its GDP on things, uh, you know, not health and education, but like just the large number of schemes is actually not out of line with a lot of other countries, including South Korea and so on. India, the government actually does. The Indian government is not small in some sense. It does spend. It just doesn't spend money on the right things, and so especially if you take into account implicit and explicit subsidies and the money that it spends directly on things like NRG, Indian state actually spends a fair amount of money, given its taxes and given the GDP of India. But it just spends it very, very badly. And this was the point that kind of we brought up in the discussion, I think, with Milan that uh, 
you know, the, the, the state therefore has lost a kind of, um, it's, uh, you know, it's weak state capacity is almost self-enforcing now. So I'll, I'll end there. Uh, Rohit, thank you. Um, so uh, I guess it comes down to me to end us. This. Sorry for going over time. We're about 15 minutes uh, over schedule, uh, but it's been so stimulating and interesting that it could go on for a few more hours. So we just give me a few minutes. Um, I'm, I'm gonna you know, try to wrap what we've discussed here and with some of my own views as well. Um, you know, one of my PhD advisors mentioned that you know, asking the correct questions, you know, is half the research. Um, the rest will somehow happen. Um, I think Rohit, Rohit and Arvind's paper, you know, asks the most fundamental question, you know, that requires a focused scholarly attention. Why has India's uh, development failed to keep up, you know, with the high growth rate since 1980, right? Um, the paper unpacks the anomalies that have accompanied and characterize India's development since the 1980s, and why there exists you know, gaps between you know, high growth rates uh, and its effects that are captured on various fronts, as discussed this evening, uh, human, social, uh, environmental, uh, and financial. Um, so the massive strides that have been made vis-a-vis you know, -vis growth, you know, have in other words led to um, incommensurate development as Rohit and Arvind claim. I want to end by just making three broad, uh, possibly speculative points from the paper you know, and the issues discussed on uh, India's political economy of development. Um, the first is on politics. So, so the, the claims in the paper you know, ask us to focus more closely um, on the politics of India's development, since political factors you know, could explain uh, why India's dynamic growth uh, does not produce broad-based development. But, you know, India is a great case to probe and examine, you know, the broader claim, you know, that of economic growth followed by development. On the pathway from high growth rates uh, to development, you know, generally flows through politics. The policies, the institutions, trade-offs, the ideas, uh, the individuals, and the governance um, the mechanisms that allow for growth to generate broad-based development. You know, perhaps in the Indian case, uh, rapid growth and sustained democracy, uh, you know, might not accompany, but skew and arrest development. Uh, so democracy could have uh, subversive effects. You know, as scholars like uh, Jeffrey Witso and and Millen himself have shown through their work. Um, so the politics and how power relations are structured, you know, will likely generate differential, uneven, uh, zigzag effects that uh, produce some suboptimal outcomes in areas like health, environment, um, education, finance, and industrial policy. Uh, my second point, you know, has to do with India's state capacity. You know, there's a general understanding uh, that as India's economy became more dynamic, you know, the state could exert its regulatory role, which in turn, which in turn has led, you know, to dysfunctional policy outcomes, you know, and the emergence of a crony capitalism, which, you know, the paper identifies as stigmatized capitalism, uh, stigmatized capitalism, you know, or a close uh, state capital nexus. Right? You know, maybe we need to ask, you know, what kind of a state has India produced and how that affects development outcomes. Um, economic liberalization has arguably spawned a new kind of a regulatory state that looks to institutional actors like the Supreme Court to resolve conflicts. It relies on technologies like Aadhaar and the United Payments Interface to deliver public goods. And market actors like big business and other financial intermediaries to address economic gaps and, and, and inefficiencies. Perhaps we need to think uh, more of India's dynamic growth you know, and the shifting role of the Indian state you know, as mutually constitutive, which could help us make sense you know, of the divide between India's growth and development. Uh, in a post-COVID landscape, you know, the state, its core institutions could become uh, less immune to certain political pressures. Um, to possibly implement an agenda uh, 
you know, that is centered on self-reliance. Should this happen, you know, we could probably see uh, more oligarchic actors, uh, quasi-monopolies, you know, that will only deepen uh, a form of crony capitalism, which in turn will affect India's growth and development. And my, my, my final point has to uh, do with globalization uh, and the international economy, or, or how prevailing patterns of international trade and investment, you know, affect the Indian economy's makeup between government, industrial activity, agriculture, manufacturing, and services. Uh, the paper claims that you know India's path of specialization, you know, that of premature deindustrialization and precocious servicification, you know, or the allocation of employment from low to high productivity sectors was large was largely due to uh, domestic policy efforts plus some luck. Um, India was well suited to exploit opportunities under the IT revolution, you know, but India also benefited from an open international economy from the 1980s, uh, you know, that was far more open than ever before, right? By the time of the Uruguay round in 1986, uh, tariffs on most goods and services across the OECD you know, was very low, politics around trade and immigration was liberal, Demand had shot up dramatically, uh, especially for personal computing services. Inflation was low worldwide. Product productivity was high. Um, all of which, and all these factors allowed India to capitalize and take advantage. Now, this, these conditions might not exist going ahead. Uh, COVID-19 and deglobalization, you know, rising tariffs, and the disruption of supply chains and the attenuation of uh, patterns of capital and investment, you know, could restructure the Indian economy's makeup that in turn, you know, could affect domestic demand, employment, productivity, and the socio-political institutions that, you know, will have to emerge to manage these effects. And I think we need to grapple, you know, with how the international economy and its shift affect India's own economic policies, uh, growth, and development. The paper you know, allows us to ask these different questions and consider these different issues you know, on what India's future political economy of development might look like. And, and we are indebted to Rohit and Arvind you know, for writing the paper uh, and to Rohit for coming here and discussing it and to all of you uh, for joining us today to share your perspective on it and the broader issue um, of India's political economy of development. Thank you again.